Lord, we come to the part in our service where we open up your word and we think about it. And we try to allow it to penetrate our hearts. So Lord, I ask that you would just give us the grace to be still, to be quiet. Give us the capacity to hear what you have to say. Lord, may you use your word to shape a faith inside of us that gives us a strength, a courage, a spirit of endurance and hope that wouldn't come any other way. May we see you, Jesus, through your word. In your name, amen. So I don't know if you have uh, upgraded your iPhone lately, but I think part of the recent upgrade is this wonderful thing that sends you a weekly diagnostic of your screen time. How many have gotten that? You know, where it tells you how much screen time you've had, how much better you did last week than this week than last week. And I just kind of thought like, how great that the very place that invented the problem is now sending me data to feel guilty about, you know? And it just seems like a, cer a certain modern metaphor for our time. We have so much access to stuff and things and data and all this kind of stuff. And, and part of the corresponding reality is that I think we all live with sort of this impending sense of pressure. I don't know about you, but I feel like in my life, there's always a drumbeat. There's always more, more, faster, faster. Someone wisely once said that, you know, contentment and rest comes from what's possible is close to what you have. And the problem with modern society is, is even if we go up, this line of what's possible continues to rise. And it creates inside of all of us a real sense of pressure. I don't think I'm saying anything that would surprise anybody um, to say that we live in a day and age where there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of frustration. And I would argue that a big part of that is just this internal sense of pressure that we feel. And this morning I want to talk about what I consider one of the fundamental spiritual moves, one of the fundamental spiritual experiences that is implicit throughout the Gospels and implicit throughout the New Testament. And it is this move from pressure to freedom. That one of the realities that in your spiritual life, one of the things that God wants to do for you is to move you from this spirit of pressure to this experience of freedom. And that is particularly true in the passage that we have this morning it's a little bit of a confusing passage and hard to understand, which makes my job more pressured. Um, but I want to read it and I want to talk about it and I want to think about it. And there's a lot of ways that you could slice this passage up and I see that. But I want to take this grid of the move from pressure to freedom and look at it. So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 12 and going to chapter 4, verse 2 says this, since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil, and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him, and we are changed into His glorious image. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all, the, all who are honest know this. I think Paul is speaking to a specific kind of pressure, 
And I think in this passage, I want us to look at three things, the kind of the buildup of pressure, the turn from pressure, and the result of that turn. The very first thing I want to talk about is this, this buildup of pressure that Paul is speaking to. What, what Paul is talking about in his context is a certain kind of religious pressure. Paul is talking about the pressure that came on people as the law of God was read to them by Moses. As, and he's referring actually to a specific passage in Exodus where when Moses received the law from God and that in being in God's presence, it, when he left the tent of meeting where God was, his face would glow and Moses literally put a veil over his face because his glowing face kind of threw off people's capacity to hear what God had said. I don't have that same problem, but maybe if I had a veil, you'd see me better or you'd hear better. But, but, but Moses put on this veil, and then Paul begins to kind of extend that metaphor, right? But, the, but the, what, what Paul is saying is that when people heard the words of God through Moses and we heard the law, what it created inside of them, even though the law itself was glorious, it created inside of them a pressure. And the reason we know it created a pressure is because the veil that covered Moses' face somehow metaphorically got switched inside of their own hearts. And, so, and if you follow kind of the talking of the veil, you'll see that they say the veil that was to cover the glory of Moses, now they put it inside of their own hearts. And whenever they heard the, the, the law of God read, they put a veil up to protect them and to hide them from the pressure. See, the results of hearing the law of God were that they said, we can't live up to it. And so they hid themselves, as it were, behind a veil. Because hearing you know, don't murder, don't be angry, don't, don't covet, don't lust, don't commit adultery, uh, honor God, honor the Sabbath. Hearing all those things, people said, okay, they're good, but we don't live up to them. And we hide ourselves. And the problem wasn't so much with the law. The problem was, in a sense, they misunderstood the law. The purpose of the law, Paul expounds in places like Galatians and Romans, was to actually show, the, show them their need so that when they came to Christ, they understood that Jesus fulfilled the law. But they were hiding. Now, I don't know about you. I don't often encounter um, in our day and age uh, I know it's out there, and I'm not saying it's not, but I don't typically encounter people with a deep sense of religious pressure. Most people uh, today, they don't really think of themselves as guilty, guilty or standing before God. I'm not saying that they shouldn't, and I'm not saying that they're not. I'm just saying experientially, kind of Paul's word of religious pressure sounds just incredibly old school. But you know what? Don't let that fool you. Because I think while we may not feel religious pressure, we may kind of laugh that off a little bit, we feel a tremendous amount of secular pressure. And what I mean by secular pressure is that we live in a day and an age where we are convinced that A plus B equals C. And if I can just figure it out, connect the dots, and make the right decisions, I can achieve the outcome C, whatever that is, that I want as long as I figure out what A and B are. What do I do? What's the next thing? How do I line my life up? How do I figure life out in such a way that I'll protect myself and guide myself and get myself to the right outcomes? And the, real, the reality of this is we sort of we, um, Arthur Miller, the playwright, Arthur Miller described it this way, we live our lives awaiting a judgment that never comes. We're constantly living under the sense of pressure that we need to be figuring out what the right things to do are, but sometimes we just can't figure out those things. I was speaking to a, a young man uh, this week. He called me up. He's like, man, I am really struggling. I'm in this place, I've got two young kids, I'm in a place in my career where I can't afford to screw up and, 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 and just quit. I've got a lot of 
financial pressure on me, but my job isn't going well. I'm not getting the feedback I want, I, and I don't know where to go. And he said, you know, quite frankly, the experience I feel is that I'm in the middle of the ocean, treading water, and I have no idea where I'm supposed to go. That is secular pressure. And that is the pressure that I think all of us live under. We may laugh off the religious pressure and we may think, you know, I don't really understand what Paul and Moses, I don't get all that. But if you at all reflect on your life, you will have to admit that that is a reality for all of us. You know, I'm not saying that education, health, uh, managing your money well, finding things you like to do. I'm not saying that any of those things are, are bad things in them themselves. They're not bad things. But just like the law that people misunderstood the purpose, we have created a new set of laws for ourselves that we can't live up to. A friend of mine um, he said in life he has learned to adapt the 30% rule. And the 30% rule goes like this. Whenever someone is saying something that they did well, they tend to magnify it by about 30%. So if they said they ran four miles, they probably really only ran three, right? And whenever someone is sort of saying they did something they're not proud of, they tend to sort of diminish it by 30%, right? They tend to shield 30%. And I think that that's probably accurate, and I think that that says something about the secular pressure that we feel. We live in a day and age of tremendous pressure. And that's why I think Paul is right to kind of put us to this place of turning Turning. See, twice in this passage, Paul tells us how we, we can remove the veil. The veil where we hide ourselves, the veil where we cover ourselves, the veil where we try to act like we have it more together than we do. And Paul says, how do we remove that veil? In verse 14, he says, the veil is removed by believing in Christ. And in verse 16, Paul says, whoever turns to the Lord, the veil will be taken away. I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot about veils this week. I'm like, we don't, you don't see a lot of veils anymore, right? The only place I could think um, of a veil was, uh, you know, in my line of work, I've done quite a few weddings, right? And, uh, and, you know, a lot of weddings, there's still a veil, right? The bride comes down, and I, and I always have a front row seat, right? The bride comes down, she's got a veil on, and the father, a lot of times, um, or someone else, will escort the bride down. And, um, and there's always this kind of, like, awkward, fumbling moment where the, the father, like, has to lift the veil of the bride, you know? It's always one of the more like, there's a lot of potential for things going wrong in that moment. So it's like a, an internally stressful moment when you're the pastor watching this veil be removed, you know. But in some ways, it's a really uh, kind of cool image, you know, because it's like the, girl, the bride comes down and she's veiled and she's covered and she's with her father and it's sort of the last symbol of like the old, right? And when the bride meets the groom and the father removes the veil and the face of the bride looks into the face of the groom and all of a sudden it's a, it, there's a brand new reality. And I thought of that when, when I'm, I'm not sure um, what Paul was thinking, but I thought about that when he said, and everyone with the veil uncovered turns and sees Christ. The lifting of the veil of our hearts and looking and turning to Jesus is the very way that the pressure of this life gets removed. The performance pressure, how does that happen? How does looking to Jesus, how does opening our hearts to Jesus remove the pressure of performance? One of the truths, I think, that runs through the scriptures is that the, 
the pressure performance is removed because it's not what we did, but what Jesus did. I remember years and years ago, um, I was a big Michael Jordan fan. And early on in his career, he scored 63 points in a playoff game against the Boston Celtics. And after the game, they were interviewing one of his teammates who had only scored two points that day. And the teammate said, this is going to be one of my lifelong memories. And they said, why is that? Because he said, I'm always going to remember the day where Michael Jordan and I combined for 65 points to beat the Boston Celtics. <laughs> But in a sense, he was, in, in a sense, reflecting the reality of the release of pressure, right? I didn't do it, but he did. And I got to be a part of it. The veil gets, the performance pressure gets removed when, G, when you rest your, your identity in Jesus. Over 200 times in the epistles, Paul talks about us being in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus means that you rest yourself in Jesus. You are rooting your identity in Jesus. When we believe in Jesus, his affirmation becomes our affirmation. His security becomes our security. When I was talking to my friend, and I'm, I was saying to him, like, look, dude, I, I get it. I get it, all the stress you're feeling. But what if someone were able to tell you, to affirm you, and let you know that you're secure? What if instead of like desperately treading water, you actually put your feet down and realize there was solid ground beneath you? And you could begin to walk through the water. You may not remove yourself from the water, but all of a sudden you'll find yourself in solid ground and you'll begin to move. I said that's what trusting in Jesus is. That's what turning to Jesus is. I can't figure out all your things. I can't solve all your problems at work, but I can tell you this, at the core of your being, you can be affirmed that you're loved. At the core of your being, you can turn to Jesus and know that you are secure. You won't be exempt from the pressures of life. Things will still go wrong, but the pressure is removed because your affirmation and security are rooted somewhere else. And the veil can be removed. And you no longer have to hide or pretend or act like you've got it all together. This is, the fundament, this is a fundamental spiritual move, the move from pressure to to freedom and all of us have to figure out ways to do it again I keep referencing this conversation but my response um, my, my friend's response was that's great but I still got to go to work in the morning that's what he said and I'm like I get it man here's all I can tell you is that this message of affirmation and security, this understanding of moving from pressure to freedom can only be preached into you. That's it. It can only be preached in. It can only be heard into your reality. I can't, it's not magic pixie dust that changes your problems. It's a deep affirmation and understanding of things that enables you to face your problems with the veil off. And the only way I know how to get it into you is to preach it into you. You have to hear it and put your feet down and start walking. And I love what Paul says. He says in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way. He's like, <laughs> look, he just gave it to us. It's total mercy. That, like, God gave us this new way of thinking and living and understanding that we're accepted by him and not because of ourselves, but because of what Jesus did. Because of that, look what he says in verse 1. He says, we never give up. We never give up. 
We persevere. And, um, and he, he goes on to say, we reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God and all who are honest know this. What Paul's talking about in his specific context, right, was his specific context was, uh, you know, it was a, a place where re- rhetoric and speakers were a big deal. And, and in the town of Corinth, there were a lot of kind of blowhards and people that could draw a big crowd by speaking and relying on all these tricky methods and all this kind of stuff. And Paul said, you know what, we're not going to do that because the veil's been removed. We're just going to be honest. We're going to be straightforward. We're going to tell you what we've experienced the love of, and how we've experienced the love of Christ. But we're not going to pretend and we're not going to play games. And that would have been Paul's immediate work context that he was applying it to. So in the same way, you could apply this truth to your immediate context that you find yourself in. That might not, you not, might not be uh, in the battles of rhetoric in first century Corinth, but I guarantee you, you have places where if you stop pretending and you start trusting and you stop trying to be proud and you humbly just walk, I guarantee you, it'll make a difference. If you lift the veil, it'll change you. But it only, the only way I know, again, how to do this is to have it preached into you. You have to hear it. My daughter um, got me into this app called the Nike Running Club. And um, it's, this sound, probably sounds like death for some of you, but like you, you, you play it and there's like a coach that has recorded like coaching tips as you're running on the treadmill and then when they stop talking it goes back to your music and then they pop back on five minutes and all this kind of stuff and um, it's just like recorded like it's not like this coach is actually watching me or talking to me Um, but it's amazing like I've been running with it and I don't know some of them have like Jamaican voices so they just sound more official or something but like I'm running better than I've ever run in my life like and and and, and part of it is like they'll, they'll get on and the, the, they'll be like, like I used to just get on and get on the treadmill and just want to get this thing over with, you know. So I'd run like as fast as I could to get it over with. And they get on and they're like, hey, you're doing great today. Here's what I want you to do. Slow down. Take your time. Enjoy your run. We'll have, some pro- we'll have some challenges coming up, but just take your time and enjoy it. And then they'll end up, my music will come on, and then 10 minutes later, they'll be like, you're doing great. You know that? You're doing just great. Keep it up. We're so proud of you. Look, I know intellectually, like, this is just some recorded message. They have no, I might be dying here, and they don't even know. <laughs> and they're telling me I'm doing great. But somehow, having those words of affirmation coached into me, I am like, I'm doing better than I've ever done. And that's how this works. It's got to be preached into you. That's why we gather. That's why we meet in small groups. That's why we meet one-on-one. That's why we believe in spiritual friendships and spiritual practices. That's why we honor the Sabbath and the Scripture. Because we know that you will not turn from the pressure of your life into the freedom of Christ unless people are telling you, you're doing all right. Why don't you slow down a little bit? Take it easy. Enjoy the walk. Because you know what? When you get out of here, I know it. As soon as you walk out those doors, there'll be another coach in your ear, won't there? You're not good enough. You got to work harder. You got to be better. You got to, oh my God, these people are getting way ahead of you. Did you see what they're doing and you didn't do it? What, what, you were left out of this. They didn't invite you to this. Oh my gosh, who are you? Who are my friends? What am I doing, right? All sorts of coaching in our ears. You have to hear the deeper voice of the gospel. You're affirmed. You're secure. Look, the veil's been removed. Turn from the pressure and look squarely into the glorious face of Jesus Christ. That glory never fades, and it's always there. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, may we hear your voice this morning. May you affirm in us, in a deep way, your love. Lord, may we be people that don't walk to the drumbeat of pressure, but may we hear and trust you more. 
Thank you for my friends that are here this morning. Thank you that they're trying to hear your voice. May you speak to them personally about areas of pressure in their life right now. And may you affirm them deeply. May they know that they are secure in your love. Lord, I thank you that your shining face shines over all of human history. All other things fade, all other glory fades away. But your shining face needs no veil, Lord. May we look into your face this morning and every day. In your name, 